la vida. Milagrosamente dos células que se unen se convierten en un ser humano en aproximadamente 40 semanas. Un ser humano que deberá enfrentarse al mundo. Desde ese instante deberá adaptarse aprendiendo constantemente del contexto que lo rodea. Formando así con el tiempo su propia personalidad. Entendiendo sus propios límites. Y tomando decisiones. Construyendo el mismo mundo al que llegó Para que otros lo habiten también ¿Pero qué pasa cuando el contexto no acompaña? ¿O cuando la vida es interrumpida? Goya Cares es una misión que tiene que continuar uh, no solo desde las organizaciones que ayudan a las víctimas de la trata, sino también llevaremos la educación a las escuelas, alertando a las familias y al público en general. que se enteren de lo que está pasando no solo en los vecindarios, sino en sus propios hogares. Ese es el próximo paso. Tenemos la responsabilidad de crear una sociedad unida y la única forma de hacerlo es dar respeto, valor, de tratarnos a todos como si fuera Jesús con el cariño que merece. I'd like to tell you a story about my daughter. My daughter was a really sweet, um, innocent, and caring young lady. She loved uh, the hurting and um, anybody that was hurting. Like, she would take time to go sit with them. So she was very caring. She was also very naive. She trusted anybody around her and anything she was told. 
And so that plays out later in her life. She was very naive. She was also a beautiful girl. And I think that was also a demise in her life, trusting and beautiful. So when I think about the story of Brota, I'm thinking about things like from the, from the very earliest times, uh, part of what we like to do is get out and help people. And so she would go out with me to the streets and we would talk to people and give them food. And, and she was just a great teammate, really, at a young age. And so as life went on and we watched her, we watched her begin sports and quit sports mm -hmm. and try new things. And she had a hard time finding the things that were special to her that she could just put an anchor in the ground. And before you knew it, it was time for college. She'd had a couple of hurts along the way, but I don't think you understand sometimes those hurts sit deeper with some people than they do with others. And what I didn't understand was she was really having a lot of hurts inside. So she went off to college and uh, I just, I just believe at that point that she didn't realize that, you know, a lot of people would, would take advantage of her if she wasn't ready to protect herself. When we dropped our daughter off at college, the very first night, um, she went to a party. I mean, it was the very first night we dropped her off and she was raped. And she was in school before the classes even started over the first weekend. And she had had a rape that night. She'd been at a party doing things that, you know, she probably needed to have a friend watching her, those kind of things. And so things really spiraled out of control when we went back up to visit. Because Britta didn't want to come home from college, she kept telling us she was okay. Again, that, that adventurous, I can do anything, girl kept telling us everything was fine, but she wasn't fine. And and not, not long after that, she had a birthday and there's a thing called hippo laws in our, in our country that gave her protection and she no longer had to share with us. She was protected in, in, in the medical world. And all of a sudden we were behind a, a wall, a mm -hmm. medical guard where she no longer had to share with us anything going on. And, um, but she was spiraling out of control and she started drinking and that drinking was numbing her and the numbing led to drug addiction. In less than one semester, my daughter was hooked on drugs. And the way that works is when you're hooked on drugs, then you become dependent and become dependent to need uh, things from other people that most of us would not want to spend our time with. And she became what people would call, if you're using a lot of drugs, they would say that's a mule one, and that she would be uh, asked to take drugs to another campus a couple of hours away. And because of her situation, that probably seemed like a great thing to do, or the only thing to do. And so now she's really not there worrying about classes. She's worrying about how am I gonna transport this, this weekend? And while she was going back and forth from these two cities, uh, during that period of time, she ran into some folks who seemed like they were more just people uh, in that world. Maybe not the world I'm living in right now, but the world that, that she was running in. And uh, they said, well, you know, we'll take care of you. You probably just need to earn your keep. And they took her to Macy's. Um, they put her on Craigslist. Uh, they gave her a name. Jasmine was her name. And. I believe within hours, if not one day, she was being sold and uh, running for them, her body. And many of these things she told me later, but she told me many stories about experiences with, with this. And so it happened within six months. We don't really realize who we're dealing with anymore. I'd say at this point, the oldest, uh, that she was probably at this moment was probably 19. Um, and at that point already, she's dealing with things that, that no, no teenager, no woman, no grown woman should ever have to deal with. There was a moment when, um, when it hits you, my daughter's really, this is true, like, is she, she really is, she really is on, she really is doing drugs and she really is in this world. I, I remember the moment I was sitting in my car in the driveway and I know God, I know God. And I sat in my driveway and I cried out and I said, God, I know you. Con un palabra visites el mundo y con un palabra pusites los estrellas. 
y con una palabra puedes salvar a mi hija. Y no me voy a mover hasta que lo salvas. Estaba bien enojada y no me iba a mover hasta que él me contestaba. Ese era el comienzo de seis años más difícil en mi vida. Pero yo sabía que Dios iba a estar conmigo y nunca me iba a faltar el fe para andar con Él esos seis años. Human traffickers know that if they can get a boy and a girl hooked on drugs, then they, they've got their commodity because it is so hard to stop drug use. And the desire for the body to want drugs is so hard to kick the habit. And so Britta was clean for three months and we saw our daughter back. And we went to California to help her. She was back in school, she was doing good. Yes. But the struggle for, for wanting drugs got her right back into it again. And so the human traffickers know that if they can get kids stuck on drugs, you know, that's all they have to do to, to, to use people. And that's why we have to be so careful and, and be watchful and, and... So one of, the, one of the people that Britta met during this time of coming out of rehab, beginning to work, yeah. going to Paul Mitchell School, she was excited again about doing esthetician school and, and uh, she was excited about that, doing really well. And one of the guys who we assume seemed like a boyfriend at the time, uh, as time went on, we realized this was a very controlling person. Mm -hmm. And it was within a very short period of time that we realized we've walked right back into this mm -hmm. situation. There was an occasion where she mm -hmm. didn't come home, even though they'd asked for permission to go on a date. I'm probably about age 21 now. And so he has asked me, you know, can we go on this date? And so he's trying to be a gentleman, it seems. And so they go on a date and he doesn't, uh, they don't come home when they say, and so when we come back to deal with the problem, um, I believe we couldn't get a hold of them all night long. And so in the next morning when I came back, uh, Elsa goes to the store where, the, where he worked and she basically made a very big scene in the store saying, your employee has our daughter, we want her back. We're not leaving, or she said, I'm not leaving until you get him here. And so in front of all the customers and everything, Elsa makes a stand. We want our daughter back. Me maré en el, en el CIA y le dije al negocio, el, the owner of the store, que no me voy a ir hasta que el, su, one of his workers me trae su, mi hija. Aquí me voy a quedar. Mm -hmm. And so I told the owner, I said, I want my daughter. So, as the situation played out, the owner is able to get this person on the phone and basically says, you get down here. He comes down here. I go back with him because I'm going to go wherever this daughter is, we're going to get her. We go back. He's all along thinking, acting as if he's going to help me get her and that it's just a misunderstanding. And we get out of the car and we get to the apartment. He's holding me off like, just, I'll go get her. I said, no, I'm going with you. And some, at some point, I guess he finally realized he's going to have to deal with the situation. And I can only tell you this, he's just one of those bodybuilders that's, we used to call it muscle bound. So he's, he's really big, strong, heavy, and he just began punching. And uh, it was almost, in a way, I could look back at it and say, it was almost like out of fear that like, I'm about to lose my property. It was very strange, very strange. And although it hurt, and uh, you know, for any people who've been in fights, if you think about it, you're kind of in shock at the moment. So much going on. So punching and punching and punching, and I don't know how, but at that moment I had, uh, and I told Elsa this at the time, that I had this thought in my mind, it's like, I'm a, I'm gonna say 45 year old guy, and this guy is, 25 or so. I just thought it was going to come out like I attacked him 
And so I just made up my mind to just let him punch the whole time. I'm not gonna punch one punch because I don't want anybody to say, I don't wanna go to jail today. Because that's how it seems like sometimes things like that happen. Uh, so I just took it and took it and took it and we scrapped around on the concrete and all this. And my shirt was ripped and everything. When we were done, he obviously was just exhausted from all the punches and, you know, I got up and I said, okay, they'll take me to my daughter. And as a father, I believe there are countless fathers who take the same approach that I am going to get my daughter back, okay? And so we went inside, she was in a shower. Think about that. What parent wants to walk in and have to grab your daughter out of a shower? It's smoky in there. She's on the drugs, and she's like, hey, Dad. Hi, Dad. It's almost as if she didn't understand why I was there. I grabbed a towel. I said, we got to go. She said, no, I'm not going to go. I said, we have to leave. Yeah, two or three times, no, no, no. Finally, I just put the towel around her, wrapped her up, came back downstairs, we got in the car. She was not mad at me, but she was not mad at him either. And it was very confusing. But we knew in the middle of that that we were dealing with, again, something you could have not prepared for and something I couldn't have trained for and something that was telling me, you know, this is really not, this is not who my daughter wants to be. This is not how, how she is. Yeah. You know, earlier we were sharing, you know, what it, what it was like when we lost our daughter. And it was like we had moments where we would have our daughter back and... We would see her eyes again, and she was present, and it was her girl. She would share the stories, like what it was like to be human trafficked. She told us the true stories of how they starved them, and they'd promise them things. Mm -hmm. She told us the stories of what the men would say and how they'd answer their phones, and their kids would call from the baseball fields and say, I'll be right there, son. She would tell us everything that went on, and then we'd lose her again because of the hunger for the drugs. It was, it was like a constant death. It was, it was, it wasn't, in the very end, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a death that happened in the end, it was like we lost her constantly. It was like losing her over and over. We prayed, Lord, if she can't fight the addiction, then take her and let these people stop abusing her. This, let the suffering end. It was a continuous death over and over. You know, it, life was always still difficult for her, but she continued to do many great things. And there became a problem around New Year's Eve. And, and I will tell you as parent to parent that you watch for every holiday because holidays bring intense pressure that the family's going to be there. They're gonna see how how's everybody doing. And that person who's not doing well or has been compromised in some way feels like I'm the only problem in this family and maybe they had six months where they weren't doing any drugs but they're going to do some drugs tonight to get through Thanksgiving dinner and I'm not kidding that is happening all around so New Year's Eve she goes to a church party and our son notices she's driving a little woozy well she had already just taken just enough to get through the evening the next morning because he said I think something is up with her we took a drug test she had uh, done, I believe, some heroin. Mm. And we said, it's time to go back to rehab, but you're not going to stay in this house. All the things we're trying to do for you and trying to love you and welcome you and love you and help you back through all the difficulties. Which, she was happy to go to Chicago and went to a rehab. Which brings in a point, um, addiction again. The only thing my daughter ever wanted was to be a mother. She didn't care to be wealthy or have anything else in life that she ever wanted to be. She just wanted to be a mom. And she had two beautiful children. For it to still 
be able to pull you back in, it shows you how strong it is. Because she turned back and, and walked away from her children. She, it's not that she doesn't love them, because she loved them. But that's how hard the struggle to turn and, and break that habit is. Both of her children are very fortunate that she took the step during those times upon being pregnant to make herself go into rehab because she knew that she wouldn't be able to control that, but she thought someone would help her control that. And so I'm, I'm thankful that she did that, and I think her children someday will be thankful that, that they did that as well. During, during this time, the pain was very overwhelming, and the way that I dealt with the pain was to, um, A, surround myself with people. Um, I could share what I was feeling, and I could hear stories of other families walking through the same thing and be encouraged. They also helped me understand how to not get on the roller coaster with my daughter. So I could respond and not react when we were walking, walking with her. Through our experiences, what we have learned is that we want to spend the rest of our life encouraging other families that you may run into times that you've never imagined. It could come from so many different ways. But we are stronger than we think sometimes. We do have to do extra work to learn things. We do have to reach out and get help from others. We do have to um, allow ourselves to take that next step forward. What we can't do is shut down and say, I don't know how I could get through today. If we continue to learn and, and, and take advantage of the things that are out there to teach us, like we're sharing this story with you, you can be strong in your decisions. You can learn how to respond to a difficult family member who's going through a difficult time and not make the problem worse but you can bring them in and build a relationship and understand each other and hopefully help each other. But it doesn't come by backing away and it doesn't come by saying, this is so horrible, I'll never get out of it. You have to believe and hope that you can get there and that gives you the energy to work on it and continue seeking out how you can love each other better. There was a day when I was asking God to make everything better. It does change, and he didn't change things, but God changed me. And I want you to know that, that God might not change the circumstances, and he might change your circumstances, but I want you to know that in the end, that whatever happens, that God works all things together for good for them who trust in him, and that you can overcome, that you are stronger than you know, and trust Him day by day. He is faithful. So in 2015, uh, Britta went off to Chicago in a recovery center, as she had done. This is probably the fifth recovery center we visited. Usually three months to six months is involved. And she had three great months there. And when the time came to re-enter, start a job, go to what you would call half-day rehab and half-day work, she wanted to go to Florida. So she called me and said, I'm going to go to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And of course, her mother and I are saying, don't you want to come back to Texas? What's, we don't even know anyone in Florida. And she pretty much had her heart made up, but also I had, I, we knew some people that lived there that seemed like they would be able to be a good influence in her life. So we thought maybe there's something there. She was flown to Florida and she checked into the, the housing that they have, which is part-time and then you work. And uh, she got a job down there. And uh, during that time period of working the job, uh, the first, again, 90 days, this will happen a lot, parents. You will see people do well for 90 days, quite often. Um, 
there is a, some sort of a time clock that's ticking and it makes it difficult to continue. She started to do her own thing at work, as in bring in other clients, as in cancel appointments and maybe be booking them on the side for uh, her own special time. And so things were starting to look to the employers of something's not right. We have a conversation and I learned very quickly that this person who I knew is saying, well, she's not wearing the uniform. And I must tell you, as a parent who's gone through all these things, even though I want her to do every rule, as a parent, you might imagine you're like, is that the biggest problem? That she's not wearing the uniform. And so what we found out was she's just kind of starting to do her own thing. And that's the sign of people doing drugs. And you stop the things that you were willing to do and follow the rules before you start to say, I don't care about that rule. I don't care about that rule. So she moves out of that job. There's a big fight about the whole thing and she begins to live in her. Now she's working her own plan. So I talked to my daughter and I said, I really, I just talked to Elsa first and I said, I really need to go down and visit her. So in October of 2016, I go down to visit her. I just had a bad feeling and I said, I would like to come and meet these people who are your rehab counselors. And so I went down there. And what I discovered was they said, she's here for half day. And I said, well, well, she still has this last year or two of my insurance. Why isn't she in full day? And, and they looked at each other and they said, as if to say, are we going to tell this guy? And they said, well, I believe those were the conditions he set. And just like I'm sitting on this couch, I'm sitting there looking at two grown men running a rehab center thinking, who is running this operation? She comes in here with an insurance card and you're willing to take her money at whatever conditions she sets? This person needs to be in rehab as much as possible, not running on the streets and riding a bus in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. People will pick her up and they will take her. So I am experiencing all the trauma that I've walked through and I'm laying it out on these guys like, you have no sense. So if you just stop right there and consider what he just told you, the addict is the one deciding how the rehab's gonna run. She's the one determining how much time she's gonna be in rehab and how much time she's gonna be on the street. So. It's, it, it's really not working. I talked to her one day about what she was dreaming for and it just sounded different now. And so now I'm looking at a 24 year old who looked at me and just said, well, dad, I gotta earn some money somehow. That was a really big moment in my life because I realized this is she's not my baby anymore. She's a grown woman. And she's already seen more trouble than I saw in my whole life. And I'm, I might be looking a little bit silly right now, like I've got a perfect plan for her to go down and get a job here at this or that. And she's like, that's not reality, Dad. So we had a good afternoon. We went to Starbucks like we always did, just have a little Frappe, I guess you'd call him. <clears throat> I got back on the plane and went home. But there was a clue she gave me before I left. And that clue was, I'm going to go work a job in New York. And this job is for the training I received in permanent eyelashes. People pay big money. We're going to book up appointments. And she told me enough clues that later it was helpful. Well, after I left within 10 days, she got a first class ticket to New York. She went to New York and this was a whole nother kind of trafficking. This time, this was not sex. This time, what they wanted her to do was do makeup for people and put the wigs on and they were going to have a team of people break into cars and provide them with the banking information and other girls, and then if needed, she would as well, 
She was supposed to be the makeup artist. Uh, they would drive through the furthest lane in the drive through and they write a large check. And they say, I just want some cash back. But they look a little bit like the driver's license that they've handed them. And so at every stop, they might come away with $1,500 to $2,000 if they've written a $6,000 check. And it's an organization that I knew nothing about. And unfortunately, I know way too much about it now. But they did originate in Fort Lauderdale. And they did approach her at a bus stop. And they did approach her and say, would you like to make some money? And at this point, she wasn't worried about whether it was sex. If I can make some money, tax-free, quick, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. So for the first time in our life, they had actually, our daughter went to jail. And all of her other discoveries, other adventures and challenges, she never went to jail. Now she has the famous thing you see on the TV, a mugshot. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know that. Nobody calls you to say, hey, your daughter's in jail. They think she's homeless. To close the story out is just that they let her out of jail the next morning. She and someone else they knew went to Boston. And then from Boston, she got someone to book her a quick flight home. And this is all part of an organization out of Fort Lauderdale. They flew her home. They put her up in a, a room, somebody's house. They moved her to one more house. And the next day she was dead. And so you don't know all the final things, but as a father, I can guarantee you, you'd all be very curious. And so many things I learned after the fact, but I can tell you this, that the policeman told me, the policeman that arrested her, they said, we came to the door to knock on the door to look for the men. But she answered the door and said, come on in. When they came in, they saw all these wigs on the table. And so she just told them the truth and they arrested her. The policeman just told me that the investigator just said, why would I hold her? I said, why didn't you keep her? She was safer in jail. That's what a parent would say. Keep them safe. Her gullibility to open the door and say, come on in to the police, obviously really quickly let the police know what they were doing because she, you know, showed them all the wigs and and all the, the, the men got caught really quick because she was so quick to let them in. And um, so they, they quickly um, gave her a first class ticket back to Florida. We lose control of the situation and you don't know how it would spiral. And I think this was probably the first time she was really involved in a real organization of something rather than a one person team doing something, you know, that was their way of making a living. But again, if I have something to share with parents, it's gonna be that really be careful about the people that suggest their friends to if you're worried or watching for your child and this, you're watching because even in this final situation, I had many people that would agree to meet me and talk with me, and that's from Broward County, uh, that's from Homicide, that's from counselors that had helped her, that, that is from people. I, I got people on the phone crying saying, she reached out to me that night and I was driving around with my boyfriend looking because I thought we could maybe find her and she said I never could find her. And other people would say, this is what I knew. And I would ask them, I have 13 pictures here. Which one of these have you seen hanging around her? And they said, well, you're missing the main one. I said, oh, really? They described a person that I knew, and I later thought, well, that person I've already talked to, and they never told me anything that I should be concerned with. So as one chapter ends, a new one opened, and all I knew is that people will protect themselves and lie to your face, and it's happened many times. Mm -hmm. If you feel that something's not trustworthy as a parent, please be aware to be vigilant. There's there's many people that can be very good actors out there. Yeah. You know, when I think about accepting um, this moment of loss towards the end of her life, 
it's there's not a point there for me um, because it's a, it was a process of losing her all the time. Yes. We were we were always losing her. Some people who maybe lose their child in a car accident one night, they have no warning. We slowly watched this situation unraveling, and I believe that we both were at a totally different state by the time that we didn't see her anymore. Mm -hmm. Mi hija tenía cinco años aquí y ese um, fue su vestido. And um, it was her first date con su papá. Y el día que se estaba, um, um, this, we were getting her dressed and curling her hair. Y me dice, tengo que ir a comprarle un, un flower boutonniere porque yo sé que me va a traer flores. Y, y fui, le llamé y le dije a Charles, Tienes que ir a comprarle un flor porque ya piensa que le vas a traer flores. <laughs> so you had to go buy her flowers right away. <laughs> Good. So that was your first date with her dad. And you remember you took her to the Ritz Carlton? Mm -hmm. Remember she said, um, Would you dance with dance? me? Remember? So I would hold her up high. And I'm not a dancer. But I tried. And so we just walked around and we went and danced and it was beautiful. Yeah. It was great yeah. times. Great he took times. her, he, we like to go to tea rooms, to a tea party, to do tea parties. And it was really sweet because um, it was a tea room and you don't dance in a tea room. But she said, Daddy, would you dance with me? And he picked her up and he just danced with her there in the tea room. And um, the waiters were so moved by it, they, went and bought a stuffed toy, and they said, we want to give you a little teddy bear and call him Ritz Carlton, so you'll remember your tea time with your dad here at the Ritz Carlton. And that was her first date with her dad. Yeah. Britta was not about being popular, or she, you know, she just was more one-on-one -on -one person, like she just, just wanted to be more introverted and cared about somebody, just wanting to get to know one-on-one -on -one person. And she, we're driving home from school one day and she just says, Mom, I think I'm gonna try out for drama. And I'm thinking, well, that's a good idea. She says, maybe I can do stagehand. And I'm thinking, okay, I think that's a great idea. So the next day she comes home and, um, I'm shocked. She said, I tried out and I got the role of the lead role for Diary of Anne Frank. She was Anne for the Diary of Anne Frank. And eighth grade. Eighth grade. And for every performance, we sat on the front row with our mouth dropped open that that was our daughter, that not only could she memorize every line, but that she was confident and Seemed to be enjoying it. Yeah. We never knew that she had an interest at all. Yeah. And it was the teacher. And this is a great yes. reminder for how a te how the power a teacher a has. Teacher. And the teacher said, I know you just want to be stagehand, but would you remind reading this paragraph? Yes. And so she read it and she said, I think you'd be perfect for this part. And then she believed her teacher. And that led one thing to another. When a teacher can believe in a student the difference she can make in a student, it's beautiful. And, and to this day, that teacher is still in our life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How we dealt with the loss, how I dealt with the loss, it might surprise you. Because of these six years of walking and difficulty, I, I've always, before ever having children, before meeting Elsa, I've always lived a life of faith that God has my best outcomes in mind, plans for me that I may not understand, but that I'm simply supposed to go ahead and do my very best, everything I should do. So as we were walking through this journey and seeing it really unravel, everything that I thought I, as people, as humans, as a father, you think I'm going to construct this amazing family. One of the things that I understood I was learning in this was that I was 
you know, expecting that I could do all these things. And that life is much more, it's bigger and more powerful than that. And so you, you have to do your best, but you, you don't know how the results are going to go. And so what I was dealing with was a lot of sense of failure, uh, blaming myself for a lot of things, mm-hmm. and um, sometimes blaming my wife. You know, we would look to blame whoever we could blame. How, how did these things happen? And so as that time continued through, by the time, of the, as Elsa would comment, about six years, there was a night one time. We had, you know, many nights where there was a lot of crying and phone calls coming from different places. And we would just say, when is this nightmare going to end? And I remember one time telling Elsa, I said, I feel like it's going to be our, our year. It's going to be rest. It's going to be finally moving to a new situation. I don't know why I said that. I'm not trying to say God told me that, but I did feel like God was telling me that. Little did I know that that next year she would pass. But what happened during that time was I began to understand, you know, life is a great adventure of good and bad. We've had some amazing highs. I had had so many what I would call wins, so many great things going on in my life with the family and all this. I guess I just was unprepared that some, some devastation would come. And so that really it was something I needed to learn, a lesson I needed to also learn through this. It's a horrible thing, and yet, and yet good came out of it. So I absolutely feel that I grew a lot through this. And so in the end, I, I feel like I'm able to help people who maybe they wouldn't find themselves able to, to, to get through that. So it's an important story. We hope it helps other people. We don't want to spend all our time blaming ourselves because you, you, you're trying to do the best you can. And the people who aren't trying to do the best you can, that's for them to worry about that. I'm talking about those of us who are really think we're trying to do the best we can and we just don't know some things. So. Nuestra unidad, nuestros investigadores van a la comunidad a entregar información. Dan información sobre recursos, uh, tratamos y hacemos diferentes iniciativas para levantar más conciencia uh, sobre este tema tan importante en nuestra región y uh, educar y informar a los padres de cuáles son las cosas que deben de estar poniendo ojo, cómo saben, cuáles son esas, esas cosas que pueden pasar que son clave de tratar de determinar si su hijo o hija están involucrados eh, en la trata de seres humanos, especialmente esos niños y adolescentes que pueden caer tan fácil en esta red de, de crimen que, que pasa y abuso que pasa uh, en las manos de adultos y personas que, que son muy malas y que buscan dañar y explotar a estas personas. Este, mi nombre es Melissa Baraja, soy una sargenta en la unidad de trata de personas para el condado de Harris, the Sheriff's Department. Este, tengo ahí muchos años de experiencia tratando con víctimas y jóvenes que se caen en, esta, en este tipo de crimen. Y nuestro objetivo ahí es de tratar de ayudar a las jóvenes a salir de ese mundo y de ese crimen y pueden ayudar a otras personas. Nos mandan a diferentes entrenamientos. Hemos ido a Florida, hemos ido a Dallas. Nos mandan a conferencias para aprender y oír testimonios de otras víctimas que han sufrido por este mismo trauma. Para nosotros, este, entender a las víctimas mejor, mantener una relación con las víctimas, porque muchas veces los encuentros que tienen con las policías, con los policías no es bueno y nosotros queremos tener una mejor positiva relación con nuestras víctimas que caen o jóvenes que caen en ese mundo para que así podamos ayudar a salir de ese trauma o de ese mundo y así en una unidad juntos los este los ayudamos unos a los otros. El tema uh, de la trata de blanca infantil uh, es un programa muy grande aquí en esta región de Houston. Nosotros somos somos una ciudad con un puerto internacional muy, muy potente y también tenemos muchas líneas de, de, de vías, uh, de, de trenes y también carreteras donde cruzan muchas personas por nuestra ciudad y también es una ciudad muy diversa donde es muy fácil de esconderse y estar estableciendo uh, actos criminales uh, donde tal vez no se puedan ver a, a primera vista. Entonces, uh, es un problema muy grande que existe aquí Entonces nosotros estamos tratando de combatir eso con una unidad especial uh, que se enfoca en tratar de rescatar a esos niños, especialmente a los niños y adolescentes. 
Sí, esta situación uh, es muy impactante. Nosotros uh, hemos visto no solamente adolescentes que, que son capturadas eh, o se encuentran en este tipo de situación de trata de uh, blanca infantil, uh, pero también hemos visto ya personas que tal vez comenzaron um, en, en, en esta situación cuando eran adolescentes y ya han crecido y aún cuando dan su testimonio en diferentes conferencias que va nuestro equipo, escuchan esas experiencias y se escucha todavía la trauma muchos años después en vida. Esto realmente puede cambiar la vida de uno en una manera que no es positiva, deja cicatrices que nunca se van a sanar y es algo que nosotros miramos que es algo muy común, que esto es algo que la, las cicatrices quedan por muchos, muchos años después de que tal vez la persona fue rescatada de la situación. Uh, es algo que tenemos que cambiar porque si no está dejando cicatrices que nunca se van a curar. Los padres deberían tener mucho pendiente con sus hijos. En las redes sociales es el número uno donde las víctimas caen ahí porque ahí es donde se encuentran muchos predadores. No sabes si la persona que, con la que estás platicando es, es una niña o es un adulto eh, y te quieren convencer que los juntemos o que, estén, que vayamos en relaciones o algo y puede ser un adulto, puede ser un señor de 70 años y tú piensas que estás hablando con una, un, joven, un, jo, un joven o una joven. Uh, hay diferentes tipos de, de, de cómo pueden manipular a, a estas víctimas. Uh, por ejemplo, uno le dicen que es el tipo Romeo porque las enamoran, esas son chicas que tal vez nunca han tenido cosas de lujo, les compran cosas de lujo, un teléfono celular nuevo, Uh, las enamoran, les prometen el sol y las estrellas y todo el mundo y se enamoran como cualquier otra persona. Uh, el Instagram, el Facebook, el Snapchat, todos esos son el, el número uno donde las víctimas este, las meten en ese mundo. Los padres deberían de ver si los niños o las, los jóvenes se salen de la casa y no regresan eh, por tiempo. Tienen que este, estar investigando dónde estaban, con quién estaban, si regresan con dinero o celular o cualquier cosa que se les hace raro que ustedes no les compraron, o un dinero que salió que ustedes no le dieron, preguntar, hagan preguntas, porque así es como uno puede reportar lo que ellos han pasado a la policía. Y, y entonces eh, ya las comienzan a manipular, y después, no, no siempre es inmediatamente donde comienzan a, a utilizarlas como para, para sexo por venta, Uh, sino comienzan a manipularlas por un, un tiempo y después ya comienzan a decir, bueno, pues mira todo lo que he hecho por ti, ya se enamoró la chica, ya, ya, ya se siente más comprometida, entonces ya es donde comienza ya la venta del sexo. Entonces ya comienzan a cruzar la, la línea sobre que se enamoren solamente de, de, de uno mismo, sino ahora, ah, pues mira que tengo un amigo y hay que hacer dinero, es una vez solamente, y comienzan a ver Qué, qué tanto uh, la, la adolescente o los niños están dispuestos a hacer y va creciendo esa confianza, pues ya se sienten vulnerables uh, y, y pues así es como comienza a pasar. Pero no es por accidente, es un mercado muy, muy uh, lucrativo donde muchos están solicitando especialmente a, a, a menores de edad, a adolescentes. Pueden reportarlo, hablarlos a nosotros, nosotros salimos a las casas investigamos lo que está pasando. Si los dan permiso para ir a entrar a los celulares, podemos ver todo lo que está pasando en el celular con el permiso del padre que pagó el celular. Este, eso es muy importante que los padres mantengan eso. Si las muchachas o los muchachos vienen con moretones o tatuajes que es raro y que nunca lo habían visto, pregúntenles de dónde salió, quién te pegó, qué te pasó. Sal más al pendiente de eso. El problema es que el, el, la víctima puede ser de cualquier tipo de mundo. Si eres rica, pobre, Cualquier nacionalidad, no importa. Eh, ellos lo que quieren es hacer dinero de una manera u otra y es lo que van a usar a las víctimas. La persona, en el caso donde rescataron a la chica de, de 16 años, parece, este, la estaban utilizando, uh, vendiendo obviamente los servicios de sexo, pero para poder pagar la habitación de hotel y también seguir comprando más drogas. Y es nuestra meta, tratar de, de proteger a, a los más vulnerables en nuestra comunidad. Las heridas emocionales que una víctima tiene que vivir ya después de ser 
rescatado o rescatado de abuso o um, tráfico humano es que nunca van a poder confiar en la gente. Um, sí va a haber un nivel de confianza, a lo mejor un poco, pero nunca van a poder, vamos a decir, un familiar, um, porque pueden haber sido víctimas sobre uh, un amigo, un extraño, so esa confianza nunca va a estar ahí. Um, por ejemplo, como un novio. Um, a lo mejor tuvieron un novio, una novia que le dieron lo que nunca han tenido y hace cuenta que le dieron todo eso, uh, fueron exponidos a vender su cuerpo o a lo mejor físicamente y otras cosas pasaron. Y eso entonces no pueden confiar en la gente. Cuando están afuera, a lo mejor están en una tienda, siempre viendo sus espaldas, un poquito como más paranoia. Um, so eso es algo que sí, siempre si, siguen con eso el resto de sus vidas, pero el nivel puede ser menos cuando agarran también ayuda de terapia. Otras cosas es también el dolor como un vacío que van a sentir, como quieren llenar el vacío que dejaron atrás, Um, como que nunca lo van a llenar, so también con eso, como nunca a veces van a tener suficiente, suficiente amor, o porque él me, me quiere si yo pasé por todas esas cosas, o yo me siento muy cochina, o con vergüenza, culpa, muchas de las cosas, porque culpa es otra de las cosas más grandes que sienten, porque dicen, si yo no me fuera ido con él, o si yo no confiara en esta persona, o si no me metiera a las redes sociales, o si no fuera tan tonta o tonto, las cosas no pasarían. So yo digo que es la confianza y la culpa con que dejan mucho ya después de que se están recuperando. Es, pueden ser niñas o mujeres, o niños y hombres. Puede ser cualquier persona, cualquier edad. Yo, um, profe en mi profesión, yo he visto hasta tres años. Aquí comenzamos a ver los niños desde los tres años, por, pero el abuso a veces pasa cuando tienen un año. No se acuerdan, pero los exámenes médicos sí enseñan que hubo abuso por lo físico que salió en el examen. Pues las estadísticas del de abuso o tráfico humano, el casi 95% siempre es un familiar, un amigo, un conocido muy cercano a la familia. Y es muy raro a la vez que sea un extraño, sí pasa, pero es más raro que sea un padre, un tío, una tía, un, un, alguien que cu sea, tenga cuidado de los niños, puede ser cualquier persona que ya tenga la confianza, porque es más fácil manipular. La recuperación para cada víctima es muy diferente porque vamos a decir que a mí me pasa lo mismo que a ti y nuestras reacciones van a ser muy diferentes. A lo mejor a mí me cuesta más trabajo para recuperarme que a ti, que a lo mejor en unos cuantos meses estás bien. Muchas veces cuando los padres uh, piensan que algo le pasó a sus hijos o algo les está pasando en el momento, y ir con las autoridades. Si no pueden ir allí o ha pasado un instante en una semana, pueden ir al hospital porque lo más importante es tener el examen médico. Y también porque después del examen le hacen una entrevista forénsica para que ellos puedan decir qué les ha pasado, aunque sea poquita información, lo poquito que digan es importante para que esos cargos um, se los puedan poner a el que le está traficando o abusando al niño o a la niña. Eso, lo que también los padres pueden hacer es estar por ellos, darles el entendimiento y el amor y el cariño que ellos necesitan en ese momento, porque sí es muy difícil para las víctimas decir algo tan difícil así, especialmente si lo han vivido muchos años. Para Goya Cares, nuestra vida es un propósito y todos somos un regalo de Dios. Tenemos esos valores, así que por eso es tan importante la protección de los niños, porque no solo los niños son el futuro, pero también son el presente. Y es tan importante que tratamos, que valoramos a nuestros hijos. When I think of Britta, I think of a young child spinning in the grass, with their hands up, butterflies flying around, and a big smile on her face. And I would describe that about her because in so many ways, that's really all she wanted. She was smart, but she wasn't ever proud. 
Um, she could remember lines from a TV show or from a joke from five years ago, but she struggled with the sentence or adding some numbers together. She was very athletic, but she wanted to quit after every season to move to a new sport. And she never really wanted to run cross country, but in Arizona at 114 degrees, she was a great competitor. She did not give up. And one person that we met later in her life said, I've worked with a lot of young men and women, and your daughter never complained once. And I think I'm very proud of her for that. I'm just so proud of that, that that's how she's known. And if I were to describe my daughter, I would, um, I would describe her as a gentle dear, a beautiful fawn who is um, graceful and, and just galloping and beautiful and just um, vulnerable, but beautiful, and meant to run and be free. And that's, that's how I would describe her. Ningún niño, niña o joven debe ser propiedad de un traficante, mucho menos llegar a ser víctima. Por esta razón, debemos conocer y recordar la forma en que estas redes funcionan. Se harán sus amigos, ganando su confianza. Los comenzarán a intoxicar mediante el abuso de sustancias para controlar sus mentes y sus vidas. Los comenzarán a poner en contra de la familia, los amigos, apartándolos de su círculo de confianza. Los harán de su propiedad aislándolos. Les harán sentir que están tomando la mejor decisión. Los convencerán de que todo lo que hacen está bien y no dudarán de que están haciendo algo malo. Los obligarán a cometer actos sexuales e ilícitos por dinero. Todos los niños del mundo son nuestros hijos. Dios nos enseñó a extender nuestros brazos para abrazarlos y protegerlos. Esto es un deber. Paremos de voltear la mirada y ser indiferentes. Adentro, en nuestro corazón, existe una llama de fe, una conexión con lo sagrado que es nuestra vida. Reconozcamos el poder transformador que tenemos cada uno de nosotros y levantemos el escudo del amor que dará cobijo y protección a nuestros niños. En este mundo hay más personas con un corazón fuerte y noble, capaces de hacer un cambio y darles un lugar seguro, educación, nutrición y liberarlos de la explotación sexual, el abuso, el tráfico forzado y el maltrato. Hace algún tiempo atrás Fuimos niños, algunos amados, respetados y valorados. Tal vez fuimos abusados, maltratados y rechazados. De cualquier forma, sobrevivimos, logramos superarlo y salir adelante. 
Ahora es nuestro turno de dar esperanza, amor, justicia y luz en el camino para otros. Mientras respiremos y podamos abrir los ojos, cada día es una nueva oportunidad para hacer algo por nuestros niños del mundo y asegurarles que estarán bien, que sus vidas valen y que cuentan con nosotros para ayudarlos a salir de eso que tanto los daña. Unidos podemos rescatar vidas y con valentía mirar el problema y proponer soluciones. La presencia de los padres, de un adulto ante toda adversidad, conflicto o desafío es importante para darle a los niños apoyo y un sano crecimiento. Mostrarles que son tan valiosos y que los amamos tanto que haremos todo lo necesario para protegerlos, comprenderlos, cuidarlos y siempre acompañarlos, incluso hasta en el final. Estará bien.